Hello, Shen. Are you able to hear me clearly? Yeah. Are you able to hear me clearly? Yeah, um, but I think the first time you speak, it's uh, the volume is better. Okay, I think we have viewers on YouTube as well. So that's gonna be good. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Meghna. I think there's a slight delay between the uh, chat and the live video on Zoom. So let's see. Uh, let me share my screen. Let me know if you can see my screen. So here we go. Thanks, Meghna. And Shin, can you mute your uh, thing, please? Yeah. Thank you.
Hello. Hello, good morning, Professor Trefthen. How are you? Nice to see you after two years. Oh, it's been a while. <laughs> yes, it has. Um, what are things like there? Things are pretty good. I mean, research is going fine. Corona, I think it has, cases are increasing, but people have learned to live with it. Are uh, your classes mostly virtual these days? Yes, most yeah. of my classes are virtual. Yeah, are, uh, there, are there some things in person? Not really, no. I mean, people are coming, very few people, but uh, most of them have chosen to either stay at home or wherever they are, so they're not coming on campus. By the way, I would really appreciate if you all can switch on your camera. I feel like it's super robotic when you're talking to a bunch of names <laughs> rather than your yeah. faces. And I believe you are beautiful enough to show your faces, so I would really appreciate that. I, yeah, I mean- uh, Afsal, can you hear me well enough? Yes, I am. I can hear you very well. Good. And okay. I hope, yeah, I hope everyone else can also hear you. So you tell me, how are things at your side? I, I, I read your blogs on your website. They're pretty yeah. interesting, I think. Yeah. Well, you know, Britain um, has sort of shut down, but not the universities and schools. So um, things at Oxford haven't changed in the last few months. But uh, not only are we teaching virtually, but we pre-record the le lectures. So it's not even live. So that's, that's a bit strange. But so how are you enjoying the new normal? Well, it's not so bad, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of fun to listen to yourself at twice the speed. Um, so I, I enjoy that. Interesting. So what are you teaching at Oxford, uh, Professor Trefton, this semester? Well, at the moment, it's the approximation theory um, okay. from, from my book on that. Interesting. And luck, luckily, the book is available from Siam electronically, so the students can get it through the library. Okay, that's perfect. That's pretty good. Would anyone like to talk to Professor Treff then? This is a good time. I think we have five minutes to talk about things that you are working on, things you liked about, or if you have read Professor Treff books, you can talk to him about that. He would really appreciate it. See Akash Kumar. Oh, hi. Hi. Akash. Akash is an undergrad. He used to be my roommate. Oh. So he's a computer science undergrad and physics, I think. Not the most interesting thing about Akash is the fan in his ceiling because, <laughs> um, thanks to aliasing, it's doing very strange things on my screen. <laughs> It's a beautiful example of alias. Yeah. yeah, frequencies. It's very interesting. So we have people joining in. We can wait for four or minutes. So is the Siam chapter at uh, Austin new or what? So uh, it was founded in 2008 and we have been organizing certain events uh, for the past few years. We have also organized uh, a conference, I think, in 2017. But after COVID happened, it was really hard to, you know, restart yes. uh, things. So uh, that really played a role in in just moving forward. I would say our uh, faculty advisor, uh, Professor Arbogas, and I thought about, and and even our team thought about moving forward. Uh, more virtually because I think now is a good time to you know spread the idea of applied mathematics and computational science because yeah. you can do that pretty much from anywhere. You don't have to go to a lab and do experiments. So uh, we started to you know uh, move things more online. So probably our online presence is increasing by now, yeah. and hopefully with everyone's support, we would be able to uh, make even more progress in that sort of space which has been left empty. I would say. And are the people a mix of undergrads and graduate students or mostly graduate or what? Uh, in SIAM, are you asking or in yes. this? Okay, in SIAM, it's mostly graduate students. Yeah. And we, we try to approach undergrads, but uh, not, not completely, I would say. So most of them are graduate students, but this year we, are, uh, we have extended our efforts to have undergrads on board. I think, yeah. I think having them would be a really, really powerful for them and it 
we have also started to you know uh, we have started this sim mentorship sim applied math mentorship uh, which we'll sort of promote soon when uh, you know when we'll have our new website uh, reestablished so it's more like we will mentor uh, undergrads on the basis of uh, like for research if they want they have some applied math research idea we'll get them connected to a someone who is actually doing research in that part if they yeah. need some counseling about you know uh, if they need some counseling about jobs or if they need some counseling in general so we can we, we are planning to you know uh, give them some sort of guidance in that mm -hmm. part and here is my professor professor mark hess uh, mark well, would you like to say hi to nick <laughs> <laughs> so you're not really in san francisco Hi there. Welcome virtually, virtually to UT Austin. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for doing this. And thanks. thanks also for organizing. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Mark. And thanks for coming, by the way. It's uh, a pleasure. I think I've only been to Austin once, actually, and that's a few years ago. Well, it is. It's nice. And it's much warmer here, I'm sure, than it is in Austin. Uh, in, uh, are you in London? Oxford. I'm right? in Oxford. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. We have our vice president here as well of the chapter, Meghna. Yeah. Hello, it's a pleasure to meet you. Hello, uh, Meghna Palukuri. Yes, Hi. yes, that is correct. It, it's great to have you here, Nick. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. So are most people connected with the Odin Institute? I believe so. I, yeah. It's because most of the computational research, I mean, everyone has, uh, has spread in different departments, but it is mostly like a common department, which is Odin yeah. Institute, and everyone is affiliated with that. Now, our offices are still open, so the graduate students, some of them work in the building. Um, is that true for you too? I mean, I'm in the building right now, yeah. so probably yes. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so we have uh, Professor Arbogas, who is our faculty advisor here as well. Uh, yeah. Professor Arbogas, would you like to uh, say something. Right. Uh, there you are. Can you? are. Hi. <laughs> Thank you very much for doing this. This is a great way for us to kick off our, our season. Great. And you're in your office, I see, right? I'm in my mathematics office. Yeah, but you are, you're not at home. I'm not at home. I just taught my lecture, in fact. What subject? Uh, so it's functional analysis. Mm -hmm. So Megana, what uh, subject, what, who are you working with? I work with Edward Marcotte. He's in the biology uh, department and I work on uh, machine learning applied to biological networks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, looks like we are one min minute past 12. Let's wait for say one or two more minutes so that everyone joins and then we can get started. Great. And, uh, does anyone want to talk about Prefren's book? <laughs> I mean. Uh, Afsal, um, Ian Henriksen just messaged some problem with the login. If you okay. want to check into the, he messaged and to see some students or something. Okay. Um, Interesting, because I am admitting a lot of people. I, I didn't see his request. I don't he know messaged why. me. I can send him the YouTube link for now. And then- Yeah, that there. works. Thank you. Okay, by the way, this is Tyler. He's, our, uh, he's one of the office bearer from uh, Siam. And yeah, Tyler. Hi. Hi, I'll, yeah, so I'll, I'll email Ian and see if I can get him in. Sure. So I actually used the link from the uh, Odin uh, weekly seminar uh, message, and it worked perfectly. If COVID had happened even five years earlier, it would have been a very different experience electronically. <laughs> okay, let's see how many people there are. So I think we can now get started because we have limited amount of time. So uh, 
Good afternoon and hello everyone. I welcome you all to the first distinguished sem uh, speaker seminar organized by the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics chapter here at the University of Texas at Austin. I am Mohammed Afzal Shadab, the president of the chapter, and it is my great pleasure and an honor to introduce you to one of the most impactful applied mathematicians in the 21st century, Professor Nick Trefthen. Professor Trefthen is the head of the numerical analysis group at Oxford. He was educated at Harvard and Stanford and held positions at NYU, MIT, Cornell before moving to Oxford in 1997. He is a fellow of the Royal Society and a member of US National Academy of Engineering and has also served as the president of SIAM in two, uh, 2011 and 12. He has won many prizes, including the gold medal of the Institute of the Institute for Mathematics and its applications, the Naylor Prize of the London Mathematical Society, the Paulia and von Neumann Prizes from SIAM. He holds honorary doctorates from University of Freiburg and Stellenbosch University. But most of us know him for his books like Numerical Linear Algebra, Spectral Methods in MATLAB, Spectra and Pseudospectra, Approximation Theory and Approximation Practice, and the most recent being Exploring ODEs, published by SIAM in 2018. He is the inventor of CHEP1, and that is exactly what he's going to talk about today, starting with the continuous linear algebra. So without further ado, let's welcome Professor Nick Trefthen. Thank you. I guess I should share my screen. Is that okay? Sure. Go ahead. All right. Well, that's not the mistake. Where am I here? Sorry, wrong, wrong page. We'll, we'll find it. There we are. <laughs> um, good. Also, that was a beautiful introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, um, the two of us met completely at random at a dinner at a conference in London a couple of years ago. Um, it's a nice example of meeting people at random and how much fun that can be. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Can, I, I should confirm you can hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So um, the way this talk works, you can see the screen is split in two. I almost always uh, do demos as I give talks and this will be like that. So I'm going to um, do the mathematics on the left and the uh, Cheb fun on the right. And the whole talk is based just about the idea of Cheb fun as a continuous analog of MATLAB, which is discrete. So you'll see the principle pretty fast. Um, first of all, let me mention, though Afsal already did, uh, two books. And these are the two books that are based on Chip Fun. So first of all, the approximation book called Approximation Theory and Approximation Practice. And the way these books are written, uh, these are just textbooks on a subject. They're not about numerical analysis, they're about the subject, but everything is illustrated uh, sort of gently as you go with Chepfan. And then the other one that uh, Afsal also mentioned is Exploring ODEs, written with uh, Toby Driscoll and Askir Birkasson, came out a couple of years ago. And this one is freely available online. You can download the whole PDF file. And I really love this book. So please, if you do anything with ODEs, uh, take a look at the book. Now, the way the talk works is that you, you can see from the page numbers, there are 24 pages, right? We've already done two of them. And at the end, there will be two pages. In between, there are 20 pages, all of which have exactly the same structure. So on all of these pages, there's going to be the, something discrete on the left and the continuous analog on the right. So th that's the entire intellectual context here. That's all you need to understand. And I think you'll find it's really interesting. And in a quick word, we all know the discrete stuff very well because we take linear algebra courses and we compute in linear algebra. And yet often what ultimately you really care about is the continuous analog. So you'll see what I mean. So to begin with, um, if we talk about a software system, the great one for the kind of mathematics I'm talking about is MATLAB, which has been around nearly as long as Fortran now. Um, MATLAB got started in 1978. But for me, for Chebfun, a huge 
moment was in 1996 when it became object oriented. In the 90s, people were talking about OOP a lot and MATLAB a little bit clumsily perhaps introduced object oriented features. So that meant you could overload things. And that's where the idea of Chebfun came from, overloading MATLAB commands to give new continuous meanings to them. Um, now, MATLAB is of course based in linear algebra. And if I could say a sociological word about linear algebra, uh, it, well, a mathematical word is that the algorithms in this field have in the past 60 years been amazingly well developed. Really going back into the 50s and the 60s, great names like Wilkinson and so on. And then the software came along, Linpack, Icepack, and then MATLAB encapsulated that in a beautiful way. That's what got MATLAB started. And I want to talk now about the continuous analog of that. So let's see, how do I get rid of these flags that keep appearing on my screen? Hmm. Okay. So. Tibson is a continuous analog of MATLAB. That's the original vision to overload commands with new meanings. It got started in 2002, though it was a good deal later than that that it became pretty big and released to the world and had a lot of users. Uh, it, it's easy enough to find. I'm sure many of you have played with it. And here's a parallel I want to draw. In principle, linear algebra is essentially a discrete subject, a finite subject. Functional analysis is in principle the continuous analog of that. But when you hear those two phrases, that's not how it feels. Linear algebra feels, I think, pretty concrete and applied. Functional analysis, in my ears, sounds like pure mathematics practically. And there's a reason for that. That is how it has developed sociologically. In principle, the same algorithms ought to work, but most of the action in functional analysis is much more theoretical. And the reason for that is that once you have continuous objects, all sorts of interesting challenges appear about regularity and so on. So all sorts of problems arise mathematically that aren't there for linear algebra. So naturally people get interested in that. And they become so interested in that that the algorithmic side of functional analysis somehow it didn't get much attention over the years. And the point of Cheb Fun is to try to fix that, to fill that gap. Okay, so I'm now going to go through many objects. And in every case, I'll show you a picture on the left, another picture on the right, discrete continuous. And in most cases, I'm going to do a little computing to illustrate. So to begin with, we all know that the convention in linear algebra usually is that a vector is a column object, a discrete object. And of course, the continuous analog of that will be a, a function of a continuous variable. And we could draw that as a line rather than a bunch of dots. So there's our first analog. And we call F a Cheb Fund. So Cheb Fund with a capital C is the name of the software system. Cheb Fund with a small c is a word for one of these functions. Of course, we implement this stuff in the code, but I'm mostly not going to talk much about that. It's all about Chebyshev series, very clever things with approximation theory and Chebyshev series. It's beautiful. I love the algorithms, but I'm not focusing so much on that. If you want to read about it, uh, ATAP is a good place to go and the Cheb Fund Guide online. Anyway, let me start now illustrating some things. So if I type into MATLAB with Cheb Fund in my path, I can make a trivial Cheb Fund, which by default lives on the unit interval. So this is a representation of the polynomial X. But then it gets interesting when you start representing functions that are not just low degree polynomials. For example, there you have the Cheb fund corresponding to cosine 20 X times E to the X. It's actually a polynomial representation of that function to machine precision. And you can see the polynomial aspect of it if you plot the Chebyshev coefficients. So every function is represented by either one or a concatenation of Chebyshev series. Chebyshev series are like Fourier series, but for discontinuous domains. 
non-periodic is what I mean. So here you have the Chebyshev coefficients of this particular function on a log scale. So you see the first 20 or so are of size O of one. And then because it's a nice smooth function, they start going down quickly to machine precision. Chebfun has figured that out and it's representing this function by a polynomial of degree 50, 51. And it can do stuff with it. So if I say, for example, f of zero, I get the value to full precision. If I say the maximum of f, there's the maximum. And of course, an algorithm was involved. It had to compute that somehow. If I say sum of f, well, that's the essential idea of Cheb fund to overload MATLAB commands. So in MATLAB, sum is a sum. The continuous analog is a definite integral. So sum of f gives you the definite integral of this function from minus one to one. You can also do other things like absolute values. Suppose I say abs f equals abs of f. Then you get something which of course is not smooth and that's represented not by one polynomial but by a concatenation of polynomials. In fact, we say that this Cheb fund consists of many funds, about 20 funds, each its own polynomial. If this were a normal talk, I'd ask you to raise your hand to tell me how many of you had used Cheb fund. I hope many of you have. It's, you all know MATLAB, I'm sure. And so it's, the learning curve is not bad at all. Okay, let's continue with some more analogs. What if I have a row vector? Well, of course, in linear algebra, it looks like that. And the analog of that in functional analysis is a linear function, which means something that we're going to take inner products with, basically. And indeed, if I take this same function f and I say f, it will show you that this Cheb fund is a column Cheb fund of length 52, which means it's a polynomial of degree 51 interpolating through 52 Chebyshev points. If I say size of f prime, well, that's a linear functional. It's also a, vertic a, a horizontal Cheb fund. So f prime is a Cheb fund row, same coefficients, just interpreted in a different way. And its size, instead of infinity by one, is one by infinity. Well, those two analogs are pretty obvious. What about inner product? Well, I already mentioned that. Of course, you know in linear algebra, an inner product is the sum of products of terms. In functional analysis, of course, it's an integral. So if I want to take an inner product of two functions, make sure one of them is in row mode and the other is in column mode, we compute that. If I say, for example, f prime times f, I get the scalar inner product. The algorithm is to, it's clenshaw curtis quadrature, essentially, but you don't need to know that. We're not talking about the algorithm. Of course, the inner product of f with itself is the same as the square of the two norm of f, so I could also type that and get 1.88 again. Now, what about a matrix? Well, an analog of a matrix would be a, a function of two continuous variables. We call that a Cheb fund two. And it took us many years to implement that, but finally we did. It was Alex Townsend, who's now at Cornell, who did that. Really cool stuff. The basics of the algorithm is a bivariate Chebyshev series with other stuff going on too that we'll talk about later. And let's illustrate that. The idea always from a user point of view is to make things as obvious as they can be. You want to be able to work with Cheb funds as if they were just formula, even though they're implemented numerically. So suppose I say capital F equals Cheb fund two, and now it'll have to be a function of two variables by default on the square minus one, one, minus one, one. And here's the example, I say cosine of 20 X, times e to the minus 10 times y minus x squared, squared. So it constructs an object 
which is a bivariate Chebyshev series that approximates that function to more or less machine precision. If I plot it, I get by default that kind of a surface plot. If I want other sorts of plots, of course, they're possible. I could say, for example, a contour. And there you can see that this function f has quite a simple dependence on x and a more complicated dependence on y. You can do things. Anything you want to do should be intuitive and should be implemented. So the simplest thing to do is just evaluate the function. So there's the function evaluated at the origin. Every one of these commands, of course, involves some coding, which is overloading the basic MATLAB command for evaluation. In MATLAB, sum is the integral. And if you have a matrix, you can say sum of sum of the matrix to get the sum of all the entries. Well, analogously, you could say sum of sum of f to get the double integral over the unit square. So there it is. So you see, it's a tool that can do some basic stuff pretty nicely and also some fancier stuff. Now, I said a matrix was like a bivariate function, but it's also like an operator. And this duality is always there. Is if you have an array of numbers, you can either interpret that as just data, an array of numbers, or as something that maps vectors to vectors. Both of these interpretations are valid and they are different. I think in the early years of MATLAB, the operator one was the dominant one. Now in the world of data science, I think there's been a bit of a flip and the data one has become more dominant, but they're both always there and always important. So for example, if I say plot F times X, well, that will interpret F now as a linear operator, which will be multiplied by a vector. And there we get something which is actually zero. You see it's 10 to the minus 18. So to except for rounding errors or numerical errors, it's zero because uh, F is even and X is odd. So I'd better say F times X squared to see something less trivial. And this is a prototype of an integral operator. If you're interested in Fred Holm operators or Volterra integral operators, there are commands in ChebFund to implement those. Only for smooth kernels, actually. ChebFund doesn't handle the important case of non-smooth kernels. It's very quiet out there. I hope you're all still alive. Yeah, there's some... Uh some activity in the chat, but if you all, if anyone has a question, feel free to ask. I'd be happy to be interrupted. It's more fun that way. Are there any questions now? Is that a no? Looks like everyone is getting okay. what you're saying. So good stuff. Okay. So the next analog, we all know the idea of a Jacobian matrix which is a matrix of partial derivatives relating one vector to another vector. How much does this component of that vector depend on this component of that vector? Well, the continuous analog of that is called a Frechet derivative. And Chetfun actually does implement that in a beautiful way, but it's, I'm afraid, hidden away under the hood. It, in version four, you could actually get your hands on it, but since version five, you can't. So, we use it all the time for solving nonlinear ODEs, but there's no easy way for the user to grab that fresh A derivative. What's the next one? Well, this is very, very important. A linear system of equations, of course, we know all about that. It's a square matrix problem, AX equals B. And one of the beautiful things about MATLAB was the introduction of the uh, notation backslash. I think backslash is really cool. Of course, it's just a notation, but there's so much interesting implication that comes with that. It's, there's the implication of how fundamental that operation is. And there's the idea that we want to be able to do this without thinking about algorithm. And this is something that Moeller very beautifully did when he invented uh, uh, MATLAB back in the 70s. 
Well, what's the analog of that in a continuous world? It's some kind of an operator equation. There are many sorts of those, integral, differential, and so on. But for sure, the one that's most important all the time is differential equations. And I think the closest analog of a linear system of equations would be a linear ordinary differential equation boundary value problem. So you have two points and at the boundaries, and you want to solve a differential equation with some boundary conditions there. In Chebfun, we overloaded the backslash to solve problems like this. And it's really maybe the most remarkable part of Chebfun is its very extensive capabilities with linear and nonlinear ODE. Now, it would take me too long to go into that syntax and so on, but I do want to illustrate it um, by running Chebju. Uh, the people involved here, originally Folkmar Bornemann with the idea, and then the key implementers have been um, Toby Driscoll at Delaware, Nick Hale at Stellenbosch, Jared Arnst in Spain, and um, Askir Birkeson, who's not listed there, uh, currently working in finance in London. So let me show you Cheb GUI. Graphical user interface. If I say Cheb GUI, then up pops this thing. Everything we do in this GUI mode can, of course, be done at the command line. And indeed, that's how I would normally do it. But for demonstration, it's good to show you. So just let me give you a sense of the sorts of things that Chebfun can do with, with these continuous analogs. And what I'll do is I'll go straight into the demos tab. And if I click on that, you can see various stuff comes up like scalar boundary value problem. So let's find one of those. Oops. And for example, the area equation. If you look at that, you'll see it's 0.01 times u double prime minus xu equals one on the domain minus five to five with these boundary conditions. Now, everything is being done in Chebfun, overloading MATLAB. So it's all about Chebyshev discretizations of continuous problems under the hood. So what happens actually is that it takes this ODE, it discretizes it in Chebyshev points, it takes finer and finer grids until it converges to machine precision, more or less, and then displays that solution. So if I press solve, you can see there's the solution, which is a Chebfun, and there are the Chebyshev coefficients of that solution. As usual, O of one for a while and then decaying down to zero. Once you're in this mode, of course, it's very easy to change things. Suppose I change, 0.01 to 0.001. Solve. Now you get the same type of shape, but with a uh, higher wave number, lower wavelength. When we started doing this years ago, we didn't think it would be a competitive tool. We thought it was intellectually fascinating, but we didn't imagine it as a useful tool. But it turns out it is. It's so flexible and actually more robust than a lot of the existing ODE software. So for sort of, if you like, medium scale ODE calculations, this is a fine way to do things. Chebfun is never a large scale tool. Um, you, uh, you're not doing parallel computing. You're not doing high performance in any way. But for sort of medium scale computations, it's pretty nice. Uh, let's try a few more things. Uh, I'll at random change the right-hand boundary condition to 10 and see what happens. That wasn't very exciting. Let's go back to demos. And uh, professor, do yeah. I have a question. So yeah. uh, how many differential equations can you solve if there is a coupled system? You mean how many different variables can be coupled together? Oh, uh, like uh, in the differential equation uh, toolbox, if you have more than one variables, then yeah. can we still use it? Oh, yes, yeah. It's not good for the method of lines where you have hundreds, but if you have two or four or six, absolutely. Let's look, here's coupled boundary value problems. Oh, we seem we to only have a couple of examples built in. We haven't done that much. Here's yeah, a nonlinear coupled system. Mm -hmm. When I type solve, it's going to iterate with Newton's method. And at the end, you can see the solution at the upper left and the 
convergence of the Newton process at the lower level. Lots of other Thank you. Things. Yeah, I'll just do a few more things. Let's look at an eigenvalue problem. So for example, if we look at the or sommerfeld operator, that's a complex generalized eigenvalue problem and it's continuous, of course, it's differential equations. Um, but in this mode, it solves it pretty nicely. There you have eigenvalues and eigenmodes in the complex plane. So a huge amount of our effort over the years has gone into this differential equation stuff. And that's where I'm gonna leave it right now. Okay, let's go to our next uh, continuous linear algebra analog. Um, what about a rectangular matrix? Now, of course, a square matrix and a rectangular matrix differ in a trivial way from one point of view. But at a deeper level, they often differ more deeply. There are certain operations that make sense for square matrices that don't make sense for rectangular ones and vice versa. And in particular, one of the reasons we often work with rectangular matrices is that in one direction, effectively, we want to work with a, a function of a continuous variable. So that's what we call a quasi matrix. It's like the limit infinity by n smooth times n. Uh, the idea of talking about matrices that are continuous in one dimension uh, goes back to a paper by De Boer and also in my textbook and also something by Pete Stewart. And in fact, Stewart was the person who cooked up this word quasi-matrix. So th this was right at the beginning of Chef Fun. It would be really interesting to think about linear algebra in terms of these continuous objects, figure out what made sense, what the right algorithms were. Let me show you a bit of that. So we still have X, remember X, it was just oops, the variable X, there it is. Now let's make a quasi matrix whose columns are one and X and X squared and so on. So I'll say A equals one X, X squared, X cubed, X to the fourth. So I hope you know what that must be. It's gonna be some kind of object which has five columns, each of which is a Chebfan, a continuous object. So if I say size of A, it will say infinity by five. If I say spy of A, it gives you a picture. Normally in MATLAB you get dots, but in Chebfan you get lines. Now let's work with A. So remember A is of size infinity by five. So for example, I can multiply it by a vector of length five. If I say plot A times, and then I have a vector one, one and a half, a sixth, a 24th column vector. Well, you see what I've done there is compute an approximation to E to the X based on the first five coefficients of the Taylor series of E to the X. So that's why the curve looks approximately like e to the x. If I say size of a prime times a, you should think what's going to appear. Well, a prime is a row quasi matrix. It's uh, five by infinity. So a prime times a is a plain old matrix, five by five. Okay, let's move on. Once you've got quasi matrices, the operations that you do with them are going to be naturally different. With square matrices, you solve systems. With rectangular matrices, normally you would do least squares. And indeed, one of the original ideas of MATLAB was to use the same syntax for solving and for least squares. We've carried that over. So if we say C equals A backslash F, it will solve that least squares problem using QR factorization which we will get to in a moment. So let's explore that. Let's say C equals A backslash E to the X. So think about that. E to the X is a function, a Chebb fun. A backslash E to the X is a least squares fit to that function in the column space of A. In other words, polynomials of degree four. 
So C will be the vector of coefficients for the least squares fit of degree four to e to the x on the unit interval. So there we are. If I plot it, we'll see a nice small error. That's 10 to the minus three. We've done this by hand. We set up a quasi matrix and did all this work. Of course, there's a lot of stuff built in. For example, we've overloaded MATLAB's polyfit command. So if I say polyfit e to the x to degree 10, then Chebfun does the continuously appropriate thing. And if I plot the result, the error, I get something down at the level of 10 to the minus 10. So there you have, to certainly to graphical accuracy, presumably to 15 or 16 digits, the precise error in the least squares degree 10 approximation to e to the x on the unit interval. Uh, I have a quick question. Yes, Tyler. So when you uh, build A, it's built with polynomial Ched funds. But you could make a new matrix that's like sine x, sine 2x, sine 3x, and use a Fourier basis. And this would Absolutely. be a least squares approximation with Fourier basis. Absolutely. OK. And uh, in fact, in this talk, I'm not really discussing Fourier. And here's the embarrassing reason. Um, Chebfun does it beautifully. But the matrix analog is a bit tricky. You know? So um, matrices conventionally have tops and bottoms and left and right. With Fourier, you want it to wrap around. So. <laughs> It's not such a great matrix analog, but the fact is, let me just show you, we can do things like uh, G equals Cheb Fan of sine of phi x. If you do that in trig mode, you actually get a Fourier representation rather than a Chebyshev representation. So all that stuff is in Cheb Fan, in fact. Good question. Other questions? Uh, can I ask one really quick? Yeah. So. In the, the least square system um, with the matrix vector, you're finding uh, a vector of coefficients so that you get like the best linear combination of the columns of the matrix A yes. being approximate to the uh, matrix B. So in, in Chebfun, you're still finding the best coefficients for a linear combination, but now of functions, Yes. right? So is, is the, uh, in, in the Chebfun least squares, is that uh, minimization with respect to an L2 integral from yep. negative one to one? Absolutely. Okay. And are, are there ways to change the, the norm that you use for the least squares? Uh, you could introduce a weight function and scale things. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And yeah, for example, Chebyshev is one that we're very interested in. And in yes, you can do that. Uh -huh. yeah. Other questions? Okay. So I mentioned that we do the least squares by QR factorization, which of course is one of the basic tools of numerical linear algebra. In fact, you can sort of, you might say that post the computer era numerical linear algebra, I think was sort of born when Householder wrote his paper about the QR factorization. That, that somehow that was a real break with the pre-computer path. To do that continuous mode is not trivial. Once you see what's required, you can do it. I won't go into it. But um, a lot of the stuff is sort of obvious. Other stuff is not obvious. And um, the algorithm, the analog of householder factorization is not obvious. Gram-Schmidt, that's obvious. If you want to find a continuous analog of that, perfectly clear. But the continuous analog of householder really took some thought. And that's very interesting. I won't go into it. It ends up, however, with this picture. A QR factorization will be a quasi-matrix factored into a quasi-matrix that has orthonormal columns times an upper triangular ordinary matrix. And let's uh, see that in action. Do you remember I had a matrix A, that a quasi-matrix A of size infinity by five? Now, in MATLAB, if you plot a matrix, by default, you see the columns. So plot of A gives you the five functions, one x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth. If I say QR equals QR of A, then you all know what that should do. It should compute 
this analog of the QR factorization. So plot of Q should plot the orthonormal columns of the quasi-matrix Q. And there they are, they're orthonormal. These are essentially Legendre polynomials. Uh, well, they are Legendre polynomials with a certain normalization. That's orthogonal polynomials with respect to the constant weight function. Now, this householder algorithm actually is cooler than uh, that reveals. Suppose I had something not so smooth, like the absolute value of x. So if I now construct b equals abs of a and plot b, this is a non-smooth quasi-matrix. But still, all of the operations make perfect sense. So I could do a QR factorization and oops, everything works. And if I plot Q, you now have the orthonormalized vectors, which will not be smooth. They have that discontinuity at the origin, but to machine precision, they are the right orthonormal vectors. So I think the potential for interesting work in this area is very much there. Of course, once you have QR, you have SVV. So you have to think about what that means. Uh, all of these things require thought, of course, but this is one you could figure out. If you know the SVD, you would be able to figure out what its continuous analog should look like. Um, you remember with SVD, you have U and V as the orthogonal, orthonormal bases for the uh, output space and the input space. Well, if A is a quasi-matrix, then the output space is continuous and the input space is discrete. So this is the right picture. Let's play with that a bit. The algorithm, by the way, it's just the only continuous part is the QR factorization. The SVD part, it turns out, can be done at the discrete level. So we have our matrix A, you've seen it. Let's plot A again. What's its rank? Well, of course, it's five because it's one x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth. What about the rank of a, a? So that now is an infinity by 10 matrix in which all of the columns have been duplicated. And you know, mathematically, that has the same column space. So the rank had better be five. And Seb Fund does the right householder stuff and reaches that conclusion. Here's one. What about the rank of one sine of x squared cosine of x squared? So that's now an infinity by three quasi matrix. But you can see the rank isn't going to be three because sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. So those three continuous functions are linearly dependent. And sure enough, the rank is two, three. The next three are interesting in a somewhat different reason. Suppose I say the rank of x to the zero to 16. So that is now a infinity by 17 matrix. The rank is 17. Suppose I say the rank of 0 to 32, rank is 33. Suppose I say the rank of 0 to 64, the rank is 46. And the reason is that numerically, x to the 64th has degree 45 in some sense. Uh, the numerical rank of that matrix really is just 46 monomials, x squared, x cubed, x fourth, are an exponentially ill-conditioned basis. And that shows up as the high ones being indistinguishable, loosely speaking, from other high ones. x to the 100th looks just like x to the 80th. And that phenomenon leads to an exponential ill-conditioning, which leads to this effect, with ramifications all over the place. By contrast, if I looked at the rank of a different degree 64 polynomial, namely the Chebyshev polynomial of degree 64. Oops, uh, what did I do wrong there? Oh, I meant to say <laughs> zero up to 64. Uh, then I get 65. Uh, finally, remember we had A, which was infinity by five. 
Well, if you remember what a pseudo inverse is, that's implemented too. I hardly ever use pseudo inverses in my life, but of course it's, it's fun to look through the books and find the standard operations and try to realize them. So that's five by infinity. Okay, I should move along here. Um, eigenvalues, we know them all in the matrix context. There's the picture. I hope you are good at these pictures now. The operator context is the same picture. You have a square thing. Eigenvalues need a square operator to make sense in the classic sense. There's a nice syntax for this call involving eig and eigs and so on, but I won't go into that. Instead, I'm gonna show you a Cheb Fun demo involving the command called quantum states, which is based on the eigenvalue command. So suppose I say quantum states of 10 times x squared. What it does is compute by default the first 10 eigenmodes of the Schrodinger operator defined by the potential function 10x squared. And now you can see that's on the left half of the picture. Suppose I make it absolute value of x instead of x squared. Another eigenvalue problem solved in continuous mode. You can see this is a fun way to explore eigenmodes. This work was largely done by Toby Driscoll in Delaware. He's our eigenvalue wizard. Pseudospectra, as um, Afsal mentioned, is something I've been interested in. I'm not going to tell you what they are. I'm sure some of you know. The software for that is not ChebFun, it's iTool. So I'm not going to demonstrate ChebFun here, but as a continuous analog, this is very interesting because pseudospectra have many aspects, but I think the essence of them is essentially rectangular matrices rather than square ones. An eigenvalue really is an object belonging to a square matrix or a square operator. Pseudospectra, however, are about approximations. And the most natural context is quasi-matrix times vector is close to scalar times that vector. I said that wrong. Well, sorry. <laughs> I, I won't go into the details, but that's the essence of the matter. And here's just a picture to give you a hint of that, and you can look in our book to see much more. Um, we're all familiar with pictures of eigenvalues of matrices in the complex plane. Here's the Gertzer matrix with a few hundred eigenvalues, so you can't distinguish them, but those are a lot of dots together with some pseudospectra of the Gertzer matrix. Well, if you make it rectangular, most of the structure is still there, even though actual eigenvalues don't exist anymore. So there's a lot of deep stuff going on there, I think. Uh, the next item is operator exponential. In MATLAB, you can say EXPM of a matrix and get E to that matrix. Well, the same with a bounded operator. So that's implemented by EXPM. Next one, a more recent one. This is a topic I really love. A few years ago, we decided we needed to figure out the continuous analog of random vectors. Random gives you a vector of random numbers. What's the continuous analog? And eventually we decided it's a so-called smooth random function defined by a finite Fourier series with random coefficients. And I'll just illustrate a bit of that. I hope you notice the pictures there. Notice this matrix here. The dots are not all black. They have different intensities to suggest different numbers. The analogous picture is some kind of image associated with a surface of varying heights. So let's play with that. Let's say S equals Randan fun. This is a Chubb fun operation. You have to give it a wavelength, 0.03, let's say. And if I plot F, I get a smooth random function with that wavelength. If I plot the cumulative sum of f, well, that's the indefinite integral of this smooth random function. Indefinite integrals of noise are Brownian paths. So here we have a smooth random walk, as we call it. So in the limit, as the wavelength goes to zero, this rigorously approaches the Brownian path. Another thing in this space we've had fun with is what we call smoothies. So a smoothie, as we've defined it, is a function that's C infinity, but nowhere analytic. And 
there is an illustration of a smoothie. Again, this defined by Fourier series, now infinite Fourier series with random coefficients decaying at an appropriate rate. Finally, let's look at a two variable one. Suppose I say capital F equals rand n fun two of 0.03. Again, that's a, a wavelength 0.03. If I say plot F, it gives you a complicated function. I prefer zebra mode or in England zebra mode. So there you see a wave, a, a random wave in a rigorously defined sense. By the way, I think in the current Siam News, there's an article by Ken Golden at Colorado and other people about random surfaces like this, relating them to uh, ice pond, ice melt ponds in the Arctic. Couple more. Okay, this one is highly non-trivial. So pay attention. LU factorization. This is like page one of books on linear algebra. We all think this is the most trivial of linear algebra operations, but the continuous analog is actually very interesting. Uh, of course, there, there are always several choices, but I think the most interesting choice is low rank approximation. So LU factorization can be viewed as reducing a matrix to a sum of rank one matrices. In the old days of Wilkinson, that reduction is exact, goes all the way. You reduce your matrix exactly to rank one pieces. But in the modern era, in data science, it's the other limit where you have a numerically finite rank of an infinite process. And it's all about low rank approximation. And LU factorization turns out to be the process of low rank approximation. So that's very interesting. And if you want to know what I mean, and this is clear to you, um, please look at the essay I wrote with Alex Townsend called Gaussian Elimination as an Iterative Algorithm. Uh, you can find that on my website under essays, I think it is. Uh, let's quickly illustrate that. So suppose I say capital S equals, I think the same thing it was earlier. That's a function we plotted before. Well, in Cheb Fun 2, this is represented by a low rank representation determined by a kind of LU factorization. The rank, well, let's look at semi log Y of the singular values of this Cheb Fun 2. So there are the singular values. There are only uh, 21 of them that are non zero. So F is an object of numerical rank 21 even though mathematically it's rank would be infinity. And we find that out by a version of LU factorization and continuousness. By the way, if I say plot coefficients of that, I get information about the column slices and the row slices that go into this rank 21 representation. I think I have two more things and then wrap up. Here's one without a demo. What about a block matrix? Now, I guess I don't have a picture there, but uh, as you undoubtedly know, in numerical linear algebra, we're constantly talking about block matrices where the structure is revealed by pieces that are themselves matrices. A referee showed us that a beautiful early example of this is in a quantum mechanics paper by Born, Heisenberg, and Jordan in 1926. Look here, you've got a fully discrete part, a column quasi-matrix part, a row quasi-matrix part, and then a fully continuous part. Isn't that cool? They knew what they were doing in 1926. Well, Jared Arnst and I have found that this block matrix point of view has a beautiful continuous analog. And it provides the best way we know to describe ODE boundary value problems. That's how Chem Fund does it. Chebfun actually turns an ODE boundary value problem into a continuous block matrix, which it then discretizes. And the blocks have rectangular blocks in them and then uh, row blocks corresponding to linear functionals for boundary conditions. That's just how Chebfun discretizes it. This rectangular block gets discretized by rectangular matrices. These two boundary conditions get discretized by row vectors. So it's it really surprisingly emerged as the most robust way we know to discretize ODE. 
I think this is my last analogy. What about tensor? Well, I already mentioned that in 2D, you have a choice of whether a matrix is a set of data or an operator. Once you get into 3D and higher, the choices become combinatorially more varied. Uh, there's no notion of an SVD in 3D that's as unambiguous as in 2D. Lots of choices. It was Benam Hashemi, who was a postdoc of mine, uh, who figured this out. Uh, he implemented Cheb Fund 3. And let's quickly show a demonstration of that. If I say f equals Cheb Fund 3, there's a function which is like a Runga function. And the idea is you can do just what you expect. You could evaluate it at a point. You could find its global maximum. You could plot it. It's hard to plot things in 3D. So if I say plot of S, that's not very beautiful. It's a little better if you say slice of S, then you have, you can do things like this, move along in your slicing. Uh, the, uh, the other commands, ISO surface gives you another way to plot step fun threes. So here I could look at different levels. But anyway, Cheb Fund 3s like Cheb Fund 2s are low rank compressed objects in which you take, in principle, a trivariate Chebyshev series, but you compress it to take advantage of alignment with the axes, basically. So this function here, as it turns out, although it's complicated in a certain sense, its rank structure reduces to 11 by 16 by 16 with respect to the variables x, y, and z. It has complicated coefficients in those three directions. Okay, so I, I'll wrap up now, Afsal. I hope that's all right. Um, I really spent a lot of time thinking about these analogs. And in fact, one of the items of this bullet list is what I was thinking about today. Um, almost anything you know about in linear algebra or, or in, well, has a continuous analog or maybe more than one continuous analog. And it's fruitful to think about those. You understand more when you study things from two angles. So Wilkinson matrices, tridiagonal matrices. This is the one I've been working on today, the DFT matrix, discrete Fourier transform, turns out to be related to prolate spheroidal wave functions. Who knew? I certainly didn't know. Eigenvalue level repulsion, the Arnoldi iteration, Sandermann with Arnoldi, conjugate gradients, numerical range, contour integral, all these things have discrete sides and continuous sides. And in many cases, both are actually useful for getting things done. If you want to explore these, go to the Cheb Fund page and look at the examples collection. So I've been basically uh, living in this mode for 15 years. I compute all the time, not just every day, but pretty much every hour of every day I'm computing. I'm too old to switch to Python. I work in MATLAB and Chebfun is written in MATLAB, so that's a good fit for me. Uh, I'm using Chebfun and MATLAB all the time. And I simply don't understand how people doing this kind of desktop computing can remain discrete anymore. Uh, almost half the stuff we do is in principle continuous. It's easy now to compute that way. And that's how I've been living for 15 years. I hope some of you uh, enjoy that too. So uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Trafton. Now is a good time to ask any questions do you have. So if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask directly instead of writing in the chat. Yeah, I had one quick question and this goes back all the way to the beginning when you were plotting e to the 20x times sine of x, when does the algorithm, when it approximates it, do some sort of iterative algorithm to pick out the Chebyshev coefficients and then it cuts off whenever they are, it keeps getting more and more coefficients and then right. cuts off after it's like 10 to the minus 16. And I, I didn't explain, but it's easy to explain. Uh, what we do is we sample the function on more and more points. So 17, 33, 65, 129. And when we get down to machine precision, we stop and then chop. The, the details are, of course, a little more complicated, but that's the idea. Yeah. OK, thanks. Any other questions?
Uh, Dr. Jefferson, I have a question. So uh, the Jefferson function, even though we are talking about it is in a continuous uh, framework. However, every time when we do, for example, we do the least square problem, we have a matrix. So we discretize the elements in a matrix through the Jefferson polynomial first. Then we actually the background use discrete operations and the, but the output we look like it is it looks like a continuous is that the picture of Jeff Fan? I might have missed a key word or two um, you're asking about how we make it feel continuous even though we're computing discreetly of course is your question how do we achieve that yeah yeah I think uh, I think you basically answered my question so I the, the basic idea is the background that discretized all things functions into uh, shape polynomials. Yeah. And the, uh, then from there, everything is discrete in the background. Yeah. Uh, then the output is still like we interpret in the continuous. Yeah, that's right. But everything is constantly adjusting the degrees automatically to keep that 15 or 16 digits. Let me mention related to this, part of our vision. Uh, you all know that real numbers can't be implemented on computers, so we use floating point. Now, people who aren't numerical analysts think that the whole subject of numerical anal analysis is floating point arithmetic. It's completely wrong. That's not how we spend our time. Most of the time, we act as if we're using real numbers and we only look at the details when we need to. The vision of Chep Fun is exactly the same, that most of the time you should be able to work with functions as if they're functions and only occasionally force yourself to look at the discrete details. Okay, yeah, this is look very fun and very important for basic research. So I, I have one more question is uh, like, uh, do we have, uh, for example, when I do some basic research work, I probably gonna use a very simple model, use Jeff Fund to explore it. Do you think there is other applications like well, in what situation this is gonna be very helpful? Well, please look at the example. I think um, we have 300 of these examples online divided into different um, schemes. In fact, if I may, I'm gonna quickly um, go for that. Is that all right? Yeah. Uh, see if this works. <laughs> so I'm now on the web and I'll go to Chebfun. There's the home page and I'll click on the tabs labeled examples. And what you see there is, uh, I think it's about 303 at this point, examples in different categories. And it, in all of these areas, you can get an idea of uh, interesting things. You know, let's look at linear algebra. So there you'll see various things that you can do in this continuous mode. So please explore there if you would like to get further ideas. Great, thank you. Yeah. So I noticed that you were talking about um, piecewise polynomials where we have Chebyshev or Legendre polynomials um, on the different uh, sub pieces of the domain. Um, where do splines come into all of this? <laughs> Who's talking, is that Ian? Yep, that's Ian. Yeah. Ian, um, so of course you could simulate splines this way, but that's not our point. Um, the purpose of splines is really tremendous geometric flexibility. Uh, and indeed, the best thing about splines is their multidimensional analogs when you're doing computer-aided uh, design and so on. Um, what, splines for approximation in one dimension are very flexible, but how do I say this? <laughs> Wonderful as they are, they got over, people got too high an opinion of them in the early years because numerical analysts didn't know how to work with polynomials. If you look in the old books from the 60s and 70s, you'll find statements that such and such a function can't be fit with polynomials, you have to use splines. That's completely false. <laughs> it's just that people were using unstable algorithms for polynomials. So the great virtue of splines is their flexibility. Uh, and representing incredibly complicated things with different behavior in different regions, maybe to three or four or five or six digits of accuracy. 
when you're really in this mode of sort of machine precision computation, they're not so important. I think. Okay, thank you. I had a question about, you know, how you said that uh, you found this way that you think is really the nicest way to implement boundary conditions on ODEs. And just to kind of keep the discrete continuous analog going. So in, in the discrete world, you know, there's different ways of implementing the boundary condition. You could directly eliminate them. Yeah. You could do Lagrange multiplier. You could, yes. I guess, a penalty method. Is that way analog? I mean, is there any... Or is it is it or does it relate to one of these ways of um, we're certainly not eliminating them. Um, so I guess in the context of your question, we're probably always in one mode where they're added in as an extra constraint. But the reason I so the, why did I say this turns out to be much more robust? It turns out that once you have more than one variable in your ODE, um, it's not obvious which variable should get which boundary conditions. We started working on problems with two or three variables and using traditional methods and simply didn't know what boundary condition would give you a solution. Um, it turns out once you switch to this rectangular mode, that issue goes away. And by the way, this is work not due to me. It's Toby Driscoll and Nick Hale were the ones who figured that out. And it's, it's really been wonderful how it now just works for all sorts of problems. I don't have a theorem to tell you that proves that. Thanks. Thank you. Cool. I think we are four minutes past uh, one. Uh, so if anyone has a quick question, they can go ahead with that. But uh, we'd like to wrap this up. So uh, I think you can also approach Professor Trefethen uh, after the seminar through email or what not. So, uh, okay, I'd like to thank Professor Trefton for taking time to meet us and enlighten us with his important discovery in linear algebra. The bottom line is we'll make sure that the next time could we plot a function of, on MATLAB, we use Chapfun instead of Linspace. With that, on behalf of Team Sim at UT Austin, I thank you all for joining us on Zoom as well as on YouTube. We'll be organizing more events after receiving your feedback through a Google form that I have sent in the Zoom and YouTube chats. So lastly, uh, please join Siam at UT if you haven't and follow us on social media. I hope you all have a great week. Thank you very much for joining. Now I will wait for next two minutes for you to fill the Google form before ending the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, one last question. Whose idea was it to name the uh, to name it a smoothie? Or the uh... that was my idea. <laughs> Do you like the name? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Real, you know, pure mathematicians tend to be very serious. So they, I like to be a little irreverent. <laughs> I think Professor Martinson is also here. Oh, great! Uh, I hadn't noticed. Hello, Gunnar. Hi. How are you? Very well. Are you at your office or at home or what? I'm at home today. It's, yeah. uh, it depends on what's happening at home. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, no, the building is uh, it's empty these days, pretty much. So. so is Odin in a building of its own, basically? Yes. Yes. Yeah. No, it's, it was actually built when I was a graduate student here. So yeah. it's, 